Graham, wonderful to be in your company. I really appreciate you giving us your time on a breath of fresh okay. air because your music really has been a breath of fresh air all these years, hasn't it? Well, that's not for me to say. <laughs> that's I, up to you, but thank you. <laughs> I've also read uh, a lot of articles about you that said how humble you are, and you've already shown me that that's 100% <laughs> true. Seriously, congratulations for, for everything that you've given modern music. You've been at it since you were 11 years old when you got your first guitar, and I hope you, want, I hope you won't mind walking us back down memory lane and filling us in on the details of your life because it's been quite exceptional the way you're, you've risen to the, to the heights that you have and, and the talent that, you, that, uh, that you've been given and used all these years. Um, well, I feel very lucky, you know, to be able to have made a good living out of doing something that I absolutely adore. Um, I never forget that. I'm always aware of it. Uh, so good. I love how you credit your dad with being so instrumental in your success. Um, yeah. And I know that, I mean, if I back up just a little bit, because um, was he instrumental? I mean, he certainly nurtured your talent from the very beginning, didn't he? Well, yes. Um, my dad was he really should have been a professional writer, but didn't have a, um, you know, didn't have any any backers and couldn't, quite frankly, couldn't afford to do it. You know, it was too risky a business. So he had regular work that really wasn't him. So when people asked me, what does your, what did your dad do? I say he was a writer rather than say that he was in the, in the fashion business or any anything else. Um, and I was lucky enough to have someone that I was in the house with who would look at my lyrics and go, I can make that better, come up with song titles or actually write parts of lyrics as well. Um, so it was fantastic to have that, that, uh, that relationship with him. And uh, I believe you weren't particularly scholastic at, at school and he and your mother both encouraged you. They, they saw the talent. <laughs> And, and yeah. encouraged you to keep going. That was pretty rare. They did, yeah. It, yes, I was very lucky in that. Well, there was a few elements. Of, the time I was born was very important. Uh, what The music I was listening to when I was growing up, even as a young teenager, the music that is still running through my veins that informs a lot of what I do today. It comes from that period. Plus the fact that my mum and dad knew that I wasn't very good at school I, because actually I wasn't interested in doing anything else but music. I sort of discovered music at seven years old, was given my first guitar at 11, that changed my life. I mean, there were a few other things that changed that, that spurred me on as well, but being given that guitar and the music I was listening to, the fact that my parents recognized the fact that I had a gift and encouraged it, I was really lucky in that respect. Yeah. You say you were born at the right time. I mean, I guess that particular period in the UK when the Beatles came along would have been fabulous inspiration. Yeah, well, it was actually the Beatles were the, my main um, main inspiration and, and still are today. But I was growing up listening to people like Bill Haley, Eddie Cochran, Elvis, the Everly Brothers, uh, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, all those people were, I was listening to as a young teenager and just thinking this is the most fantastic thing. And then to top it all, the cherry on the cake was the, listening to the Beatles in the early 60s. And that, that really spurred me on to not only want to, I'd already wanted to be a, sort of a musician, but to uh, try my hand at songwriting, really. Yeah. Well, try your hand, you did very successfully. I mean, you were quite young when you wrote for the Yardbirds and, and they had th those couple of hits uh, from you. How did yeah. that come about? I was 19 uh, when I wrote that song. Um, and my manager at the time said, you should try and get this song to the Beatles. I said, you know, the Beatles, I think, are doing OK in the songwriting department. But he mentioned this to a, a, a publisher and the publisher said that ain't going to happen. However, the Yardbirds are doing a, um, a Christmas season with, with, um, with the Beatles and they, they've decided that they want to 
because they were kind of just like a rhythm and blues band at that point, that they wanted to try and get have a hit and they were looking for outside material. So even though it was a kind of stupid idea, it turned into something really positive for me in that the song was got to the Yardbirds and became, you know, a big hit. How did it feel for you? Sorry? How did it feel for you? How did it feel? Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Because I was a fan of the Yardbirds anyway. I'd seen them play live before I wrote the song. And um, I was absolutely delighted and loved their version of it. Although it was, it was a little bit different from the demo that I, I sent them. Because um, they added the harpsichord was a big, that was a real big, uh, uh, big change from my original demo. Right. So as a young man, you're writing all of these love songs. And each one of you, each one of the songs that you were writing at the time was about yearning for love. Is that what was going on inside you? Is, was that where you were at? Uh, some things, as with all writers, some things are complete fabrications and some things are based on the truth. So there was a mixture of it, really. Although I find now I'm more prone to writing about real... I'm not going to write about having seeing somebody across the street as a the age that I am and thinking, oh, I'd love to get to know her or things like that. So I'm writing more about songs about real real life events or inspired by real life events um, as, a, as a basis for, for something. Uh, and certainly not sort of so much love songs in, like, in, the, in the true sense of the word. So, I mean, if they are, they're, they're about my wife or inspired by my wife. Yeah, no, I Who's my that. muse, actually. I finally got a muse at this late stage. <laughs> I want a muse. Where's my muse? Oh, that is. Everyone should have a muse for sure. Yeah, everyone should have a muse. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, I mean, so so the songs that you did write at that age actually do show quite a lot about you. I mean, did, did you, how did you learn to write songs? Did you... You know, there wasn't the internet to look up, you know, rules around songwriting. I guess you it, knew it, that they had to be a, about love because that was all the fashion. That's what people wanted to you hear. Don't, you, you don't learn to write about, you don't learn to write songs. Like, you don't learn to write poetry, do you? No. you can't, there's no, you can tell people, you, you know how to rhyme, you know, a line, but because one word should end the same way as another word but not be start in the same way but you can't writing is a gift it's as simple as that I, I don't I don't think you can teach somebody you can you can guide them as as to how as, as to how a, an arrangement of a song can be but the actual process of putting the notes together with the and marrying them with the right words that's not enough what what it needs is that it makes you feel like I felt when I'm writing it and good enough for you to want to go, oh, I want to buy the record of that, that song because it makes me feel whatever, you know. Right. And, and so it's, get... not, it's not, it's not, it's nothing, I always say, and I'm not being modest here, it's not clever, it's a gift. You've either got it or you ain't. You can't buy it either. Really? You can't but develop it? That's so how I feel about is... it. Yeah, there's no hope for me then, huh? <laughs> I'll no have to make my whatsoever. living elsewhere. <laughs> but, but you have your you have your skill as maybe you know when you're putting this interview together, how you do that and how that yeah, forms and it keeps the reader interested. Did you learn that or is it inherent? No, I think that's inherent too. I think that's exactly yeah, right. Then the something thing, that you then. can't pass on to to somebody else. Yeah. So when did you first realise that you had this talent? I mean, there, there must have been many times that you sat down to write songs or actually wrote them and they didn't um, make the top 10 or the top 30 or the top 100. Well, I knew it when I had a hit, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> that was all the proof I needed. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, I just kept, I was on a roll then. Yeah, I, I said earlier that most of your songs were about love at that time, but that's actually not true because in 1966 you wrote a uh, bus stop for the Hollies, and yeah, uh, well that was that, but that was it, it was still a love song uh, inspired by before I became a sort of professional songwriter, a musician. Um, I had a job in a in an outfitter's shop, and um, 
I used to get the bus every day and there was, it was a fantasy. But the fact was that I used to, you know, the bus was a part of my daily life, getting the bus and going to a bus stop. So And there was a girl you fancied on the that. bus? I, I don't actually think that there was anybody particular or someone that used to be at the bus stop every day, but I thought it was a lovely idea. I think I mentioned this, this idea to my dad and I came home and he'd written the first verse. I saw the verse and I went into my bedroom and I just wrote most of the song because of the meter of the words um, suggested the melody. So that's the timing of the words. So I just heard. Incredible. Yeah, but that's the, I, I, I don't know where it came from. I've heard different songwriters say that they, that the ideas just drop like manna from heaven. Sometimes they, everyone they, they will just say land exactly on you. the same. Everyone will say exactly the same thing. It's like sometimes it's like the song is already there, and I call it chasing the song because I'm hearing it and I'm, you know, playing it as it's unraveling itself. It's it's sort of, I, I try not to. I don't want to understand it if there's any sort of, uh, there can't be any science in it. It's something that's going on in your subconscious. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm writing songs now talking to you, but who knows? But the mm -hmm. right, when I sit down, the act of put, playing the, you know, started playing the guitar, it's like, I guess, like putting on a uniform that kind of changes you. Uh -huh. um, and that's what happens with the guitar. So I'm, I'm kind of just sort of messing around and then, I go, oh, those two chords sound lovely together. And then a melody forms or that informs a, a mood and an idea. Um, and, and it comes in all different forms. You know, I mean, for what, what you never know what you're going to write about. So it's like, it's quite exciting to sit down with the guitar and just see what well, going to Or maybe yeah, nothing, right. or maybe nothing. And do you get disappointed if nothing happens? No. I don't expect it. Oh. I just think when it happens, I'm 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 happy. And what it is, and where it will go, nobody knows. But I mean, I've had a, a, an instance recently of writing a song that I just wrote it because I wanted to write it, and it's led on to some really wonderful things. I want to talk to you about all the stuff that you're writing today. We'll certainly build up to that. Um, okay. if, if you're okay to hang in with me. And um, there's a lovely story around the Herman's Hermit song, No Milk Today, which uh, that wasn't a love story. Um, but uh, your dad was was uh, pretty involved in that one too, wasn't he? Very involved, yeah. I mean, his, his idea, um, having been to visit one of his friends, he turned on the doorstep and noticed the empty milk bottle and said to me, came back home, said, I've got a great idea for a song, No Milk Today. And I didn't understand what it was going to be about. And I said it, that wasn't a, such a great idea because like, who cares about the fact that nobody wants any milk that day? And he, he said quite rightly, he said, it's, not, it's nothing to do with that. It's what the empty milk bottle symbolises. And it's such a great idea. Yeah, so it, it's clever man. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, were the two of you very close? Very close. You and your dad? Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. not with us anymore. I'm an only is he? child. I don't know whether that's got something to do with ah, it. Yeah, probably does. He's not still around. Well, I'm today. sure it informs a lot of what I, well, I think with everybody, it, it um, informs how they are and their personality, et cetera. Yeah, right. Oh, you're very lucky. Um, Graham, you took yourself off to New York in about 1969. Why did you yeah. head to New York? You were so happy in Manchester. What what changed? I was I was going through a bit of a um, not such a creative patch, and I got approached by these two guys from New York, Kaznets and Cats, who were famous for bubblegum music, which was about pretty much opposite of what my I was thinking about doing. But they wanted to get. I think they wanted to kind of up their game a bit and move away from bubblegum and they were looking for writers who would help them do that. So I went to New York and I didn't like it at all actually. There was a kind of a, 
factory mentality. I like Jerry and Jeff very much. I thought they were fantastic characters. But the music that we were doing wasn't that great. And I eventually said, well, look, I, I don't wanna, I'm not going to carry on here, but let me take the songs that I've written back to back home. I'm involved in a studio. I'm working with some friends in the studio. Let me go back there and let me record the stuff there. And, I'll, and then I'll send it back to you. And that's what I did. And that was actually one of the elements that brought 10CC together. Because so? the studio was Strawberry Studio, that was a studio that I was a partner in, and the other guys were Eric Stewart, Kevin Godley, and Lord Quinn. And and that's where you met them through the studio. I did. I'd met them, Kevin and Lord. I'd met them all before, but what I'm saying is, us getting together to record those sort of bubblegum type songs, uh -huh. or not quite bubblegum type songs, but those songs that were produced with Kaznet's Cats helped bring us together. It was one of the elements that brought us all together. So you're talking about songs that uh, that you did for bands like the Ohio Express, songs like yeah, Sausalito. Uh, yeah, under the name. Yeah, they, they were the, the bands all, like, didn't exist. They were all such musicians. But we recorded them because we were doing, we were recording lots of stuff that weren't necessarily us, but we thought it was good business for the studio. And the main thing was that we enjoyed doing it. Huh. Even but though it wasn't our sort of music, it was it was vastly different to your sort of music, wasn't it? Yeah, so I other... know, but it was still it was still music. Yeah, and the other guys didn't mind playing that. Was that was that kind of akin to their style, or they were just happy making music? It was too? nothing to do with anybody's style. It was just to do with us having something to work on, helping the the studio in a business sense, and just. Uh, you know, working together, which we enjoyed. Right. So, w when did the four of you decide to to form a band, all of your own? In nineteen seventy, in nineteen seventy two, we were we'd done some recordings. Well, we'd done loads of stuff. We'd actually just finished an, doing an album with uh, Neil Sadaka, and we'd started writing and stuff together and recording it when the studio wasn't working, and one of the tracks that we had uh, was going to be released on Apple Records and we thought we'd better make a B-side and that B-side was Donna and when we recorded it we realised we had something special and um, that kicked it off so it's really um, by mistake in a funny sort of way that we, we, ne we never intended to do it necessarily but when we recorded that we thought and that's pretty good. I mean, we obviously wanted to do something, but yeah. it was that that was the record which was our first hit single in the UK right. that kicked it all off. And where did the name 10cc come from? Don't you know? No, I don't. You have no so idea. much I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, our first, the guy that ran our first record company, Jonathan King, um, he came up with the name. He said he. The night before he'd been up to see us, he'd had a dream that on the, the Hammersmith Odeon, which is a venue in at the time in, in London, on the hoarding it said 10CC, the best band in the world. The, the, he saw this in his dream. Ah, so yeah. So you took it from there. And, and it doesn't mean anything, 10CC, does it? It's not a horsepower thing or anything else. He just had this vision. It was came from a dream. Someone told us later on that the average male ejaculation is nine cc. So <laughs> that's what we used to say was the uh, was the reason for the name because it was kind of funny, and um, it was quicker to it was a quicker explanation because it got actually got quite boring after a time. People asking us where did you get the name from? <laughs> right, 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 right. So you made up the ejaculation thing. That's not even true, is it? We didn't. No, it is true. Is it? <laughs> we were told that, and um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. We were told that, and we adopted it because it was more fun. Yeah, it was. Ten CC was a pretty fun band. You were doing lots of great, um, lots of great songs together. Um, all of which you wrote, or most of which you wrote? No, um, it was a very much a um, mixture of writing teams. 
There were basically two teams, but we did mix it up quite a lot. If you look at the credits, you can see who wrote what. Um, and it worked out really well, very well indeed. Most of the big hits, though, you wrote. I co-wrote. Are you? Oh, we, OK. OK. No one wrote single no CC songs until the later years that were written by one person. They were all co-writes. Some okay. of them three writers. Oh, OK. And, and what was the process that you adopted when you sat down with others? Because until then, you had written, as I understand it, by yourself. It was... Yeah, a lot of the time, but I did I did co-writing in the 60s as well. Just the same as any other process. You sit down, you start messing around, and something happens, all being well. And were there any arguments around that, or mostly you were in agreement and, and working with somebody else obviously elicited, elicited great stuff? We had a lot of respect for each other. So if someone presented a song, two of us had written a song, we, we played to the other guys, and, that, and the principle was, if you think it's good enough, we'll join you in on it, join in on it, and produce it. But we have the right to change things. So they might say, well, this is great, but let's change the rhythm of it. And you go, that's a much better idea. Let's do that. Right. A real collaborative effort. That's great. Of all, the songs, so. of all the songs that you did have a hand in writing, Graham Goodman, is there one in particular that you could point to as your absolute favourite? The fact that they actually get written means that they they must have something about them to actually get finished. So I don't like saying that the ones, I mean, I can tell you the most, the ones that are the most fun to play or the, the ones that have the most effect on an audience when you play them live in particular. Which I mean, one? like I'm not in love is always, you can feel that kind of a intake of breath when it starts. Um, and Dreadlock Holiday uh, is always a sort of most fun song to play. Is it? So I'm Not In Love has the most impact on the audience. and I would and, say so, yeah. And you enjoy Dreadlock Holiday most? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Just because it's a fun... Do you know the record? Of course I do. Yeah. Some uh, things uh, I don't know, it's that very, I do. <laughs> it, it's a very, uh, very upbeat and people like singing the chorus. It's, it, it draws people in. Where's the inspiration from that one come from? It, I, I was on holiday in Jamaica and met a guy and we were talking about sports and I said, what about cricket? We were talking about Manchester United, who I support. Of course. Um, talk about football and then cricket. And I said, what about cricket? Do you like cricket? He said, no, don't like it. I said, oh, I'm surprised. He said, I love it. <laughs> and he gave me the line. <laughs> Thank you. Great. I don't know his name. <laughs> <laughs> I own. <own. laughs> That's awesome. I wonder if he realises that. You've I, never I spoken know, to him I, since. I haven't received any letters from his lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what a writer does anyway. Your ear is always on the yeah, lookout. Print. Your ear is always on the lookout. <laughs> yeah. Your ear can be on the lookout yeah. um, for, you know, some something hits you and you think, mm, that's... I get a lot of ideas from the things people say. A lot of ideas. They don't know the say <laughs> they're saying song titles. Are they, are they the ideas... People do say song titles. Yeah, right. Are the ideas still coming as thick and fast as they ever did? Yeah, as much as ever, yeah. H has your songwriting changed? Yeah, in that, uh, I was saying before, things are a bit more personal now. Right. So I write about things re that really happen. And and that that's really nice. It makes it easier in a way because you've already got the lyric idea. Right. Right, right. Um, 10CC lasted um, a good few years and yeah. uh, you disbanded because uh, because of the motor accident that Eric was involved in, is that right? That was the sort of beginning of the end, uh, really. We, we weren't getting on. We did reconvene in the 90s uh, as 10CC, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't a happy relationship and both of us wanted to discontinue it. But I started the live band, uh, which tours now very successfully, uh, you, with um, Rick Fenn, who played lead guitar with us uh, when we did the what, Mark II uh, band after Kevin and Godley and Lyle Cream left in 1976. Yeah. He, he's with me now, and so is Paul Burgess, who was a drummer with the original 10CC when we went on the road. 
And you still like being on the road? Yeah, I love it. Do yeah. you? Amazing. Even even though travel's become so much more difficult and... Um, I know everybody says that. It's a bit you don't find it. traveling, but the, play, the easiest part is playing. It's always fun and I enjoy it. And if I didn't enjoy it, I, I don't have to do it. I wouldn't do it. So, but I really love it. And it's great. And have you lost count of the number of songs that you've written? I haven't counted them. I don't yeah. see any point. I think the, the important ones you remember, you know, so maybe there's about, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know. I'm not, I don't see any point in. Right. Yeah, because because you've had a few solo albums out too. You you do have one out currently too, don't you? Yes, it's called Modesty Forbids. <laughs> Tell me about the title. Well, I love the title. I do too. I, when I'm on the road, I we do a show called Heart Full of Songs, which is like an acoustic show where I, I sing like 10 CC stuff, all the 60s stuff, film songs, loads of stuff, and lots of new stuff. Um, and I tell the audience that I've just released a new album. It's the most fantastic album you've ever heard. It's absolutely brilliant. It's called Modesty Forbids. I just like that title. I think it's very quirky. I mean, by saying the fact that Modesty Forbids, you're actually not being very modest, are you? <laughs> you know, like I could be really modest and tell you how amazing I am, but I'm not going to. In Will itself, you... I just, just, a, just a quirky title. And the cover yeah. of it is a... Um, I don't know if you see in the cover of it. It's it, it's a a peacock, but with its eyes black down. At that the anonymous peacock. So we know a peacock is very much about flaunting its beautiful feathers. Of course. But it's been blacked out, so you can't identify it. Which is a great idea. You should check it out. Right, 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 right. So you're um, you've been touring. You you I know that this that sorry the, uh, that album came out pre pandemic. And you it was intend... actually just, yeah, it was actually the month the pandemic started. Great timing. Yeah. And you, yeah, were, great timing. you were you were about to hit the road with it then. Have you resumed um, yes. touring? Yeah, that's why we've had a very, I mean, we, we've, we did a big UK tour earlier this year, a big city tour, and we're about to start a, uh, a provincial city tour, 27 dates, I think starting at the end of this month and pre-pandemic you were here in in this lovely country of australia you've got quite a, a strong affinity with australia and certainly australia with you uh, are we likely yeah. to see and we're you back coming here? back yeah we're going to go back next next year all being well um i think we're going in june oh fantastic into, into the beginning of july i believe oh that's awesome and and what will we hear from you at that time all the old stuff as well as the new stuff you're going to hear some new stuff as well. Uh, there's a song that um, from the Modesty for Beds album that I wrote about my time with being with Ringo Starr and the All Star Band called Standing Next to Me. We do that. We're also doing a very new song um, that I wrote about the James Webb Space Telescope. Do you know about the James Webb Space Telescope? I do. It's a strange subject for a song, that. I know, but I became enchanted by it. And um, I wrote a song about it from the point of view that I'm the telescope. And um, I played it to the guy at my record company and he said, you, you should get someone like Brian May to play on it because he's a brilliant guitar guitarist, obviously. And he's also an astronomer and an astrophysicist. And I did, and he does, he plays on it. Wow, it's yeah, very fantastic. authentic. And, it's what I've just been at. Uh, I was in Armenia recently um, at a thing called the Starmus Festival, which is something that Brian started off with a, 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 an Armenian um, astronomer, an astrophysicist. And um, this festival is the sixth one that they've had, and it brings together science and music. And uh, it was fantastic. And we, wow. we played the song, which is called Floating in Heaven. We played it together with the with the Armenian operatic orchestra. It was incredible. Wow. And we did and I, I, we did some other stuff. We did for your love and half for soul together, as well. Mm, your music has changed a lot, hasn't it? It it must have been such a huge thrill for you to have had the Beatles as your mentors so early in life, and then to be playing yeah. in Ringo's band. 
Can you? I, I am if... pretty much. I am pretty much everything. It, you know, without them, I'd there have been no ten CC. I'm sure. I mean, we'll never know, but they were just too important. They were important to a, forming a lot of bands, weren't they? I mean, again, it was it was it all about the time when they came along, or was it that they were so revolutionary in what they were doing, or a combination of? Both? I could talk to you. I could talk to you all day about it, but right. you've got a picture of them there. I've got stuff here. You know, I played with yeah. Gringo. You know, it's it's too big. <laughs> that's true so is there anything still on your bucket list graham goldman or have you achieved everything you set out to no no i'll never achieve everything I it's not that i want to achieve anything i i just want to i want to keep doing what i'm doing i, I as i say like as far as doing live work is concerned I, i'll never stop i'll be stopped um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do it but um if some other force <laughs> comes into play, then I can't do anything about that. Um, and also, I mean, so my sort of philosophy is like I've been asked to write a book, like I've been asked a few times to write a book, but I, do you know what? It means like going backwards, and I don't really want to do that. I've got my, actually my story is quite well documented anyway through the. I don't know how many interviews I've ever done or stuff that's been written about me. Um, you, you know, someone could put a book together quite easily. Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't want to talk about things that would make anybody uncomfortable or no one's going to write a book with, you know, a tell-all. I certainly wouldn't do that. And I'm just not that interested. I'm more interested in what I'm going to do today and tomorrow rather than, you know, yesterday. Right. And you're still living in Manchester? You're still just as in love with no. Manchester? Oh, you've not anymore? No, no, I still love Manchester. I, mean, I, I wrote a song about uh, Manchester called uh, Memory Lane, which is on an album called Love and Work that I put out in 2012. Um, but uh, no, I've lived in London since the mid 80s. Better, better place to to make the music from, to be in the centre of it uh, all. Not necessarily. I just... I. I I moved here because I was spending more and more time here. My children were getting older and were more, in, you know, independent, and I felt it was the right time. I ask all my artists this, that have children: Are yours, like most people's children, really proud of you? Are they proud of me? I hope so. Yes, I think they are, and I'm proud of them. That's lovely. Now I'll let you go. Graham Goldman, an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Nice Thank speaking you. to you.